LAFC goes for a second consecutive MLS Cup. Shohei Otani to Toronto. Sounded a little bit too good to be true, didn't it? And a Clippers guard whose penis allegedly has a mind of its own avoids criminal charges. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is December 9th, 2023. Lovely morning. Can't wait to go out and enjoy it. But do you like being in the know about LA sports? Because if you do, quickly clack the like button. Quickly clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. I look forward to hearing from you guys. Now, before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Kawhi Leonard. Remember him? For all this last month or so, all we've been talking about when it comes to the Clippers is James Harden, Russell Westbrook, maybe a little bit Paul George. What about Kawhi Leonard? Well, you talk and tell you. Kawhi Leonard dropped 41 points on the smooth jazz last night. Clippers 111, Utah 103. The Clippers are now over 500 at 11 and 10. Meanwhile, today, I want to do the scoreboard a little differently because I want to break down MLS Cup Final. LAFC is at Columbus at 1 o'clock. The black and gold are looking for a second consecutive MLS Cup. Now, there aren't too many soccer scribes in the country, but they are listing all the cool little side stories first. And I get it. There are a bunch of cool little side stories. Is it Carlos Vela's last game with LAFC? Is it Giorgio Chiellini's last game anywhere? What about Maxine Crapo shattered his leg like a hobo throwing a bottle against the curb in last year's cup? They're all cool stories, but I'm focusing on the game because it's a terrific matchup, guys. It's really a good matchup. Both of them, for example, have dynamic go-to strikers. Dennis Bawanga at LAFC, Cucho Hernandez over at Columbus. And I'll even go so far as to tell you that I despise Columbus. It is a trash town. I spent a few weeks there. It is an awful place to be. But I'm gonna tell you something. If you focus on Buwanga versus Hernandez, you're oversimplifying things in my opinion. Because if it were that simple, then you go, okay, it's Buwanga and LAFC is gonna repeat. But I don't think it's Buwanga versus Hernandez. I think this is about who sets up Buwanga versus who sets up Hernandez. The midfield. Because a lot of times in championship matches, it's a secondary player who steals the show. I'm guessing whichever midfield plays the better game wins MLS Cup. And there is no doubt, by the way, that LAFC has a quality midfield, at least in the starters. I'm not so sure about the reserves, but definitely the starters. But then you got the crew. Darlington Nagby is pursuing his fourth MLS Cup. He's been able to do so for a reason, guys. The dude is absolutely unflappable. So if I were to make a prediction, and I don't trust myself with any predictions, because both teams have played with real grit. LAFC has played all year with a target on its back. The crew had to win two road games to get here, and last week had to come from two goals down to win. And I hate Columbus, but I think the crew's going to win. I, I could damn sure be wrong, no question about that. But here are the two reasons that I think the crew are going to win. Columbus is at home. That's definitely one. And the other reason, LAFC has had two other shots to lift a trophy this year, and they whiffed on both. That's my belief. The Lakers are going to play Indiana at 5.30 in the NBA in-season tournament finale. whoop the freaking do And uh, UCLA is at Villanova at 5. The Kings are going to be playing at the New York Islanders at 4.30. Quentin Byfield has five goals in his last six games. So there is that. Let's get back to the news. The story broke yesterday that Shohei Otani was on a plane bound for Toronto, which would obviously indicate that he was going to sign with the Blue Jays. And I got to tell you, the coverage was extremely weird. Everybody was overloading on Otani going to Canada. It, it was kind of like CNN just 
following the Trump plane as Donald went off to yet another criminal indictment, right? Kind of had that, oh, let's chase the white Bronco vibe from back in the 1990s. There was just something about it where it was like, this is a little too weird to be true. And of course, the story got debunked. Well done, scribes. Well done. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this means Otani is definitely going to be a Dodger. I don't know where Otani is going to sign. For all we know, he likes Toronto. I've been to Toronto. It's a really nice place. I like Toronto. I had a lot of fun there. But what I want to do is if you're a Dodger fan, as I am, I want you guys to not blast the panic button because you would obviously want Otani on your team. But the Dodgers started the offseason building a contingency plan in case they didn't sign Otani. The reason that they re-signed Max Muncy was not to necessarily have him play infield. It's because they wanted him to play DH and mix in a little infield. It's one of the reasons that they signed Jason Hayward. The Dodgers, this, again, the scribes have been profoundly wrong across MLB Hot Stove. We have had as many as 38 names of players that the Dodgers are allegedly going to move heaven and earth to get. The only one that they've hit on was Jason Hayward. A number of these other players have been crossed off the list. There's still 33 players left on this list. So again, the scribes are not like Moses walking down from Mount Sinai with two tablets. This is not holy writ. This is scuttlebutt chill. You have no other choice. And besides, even if Otani signs somewhere else, again, they've activated plan B just in case. You get Otani, awesome. You don't, you refill the holes in the infield, you refill your pitching staff. Plan B, plan C. Criminal files will, uh, charges will not be filed against Clippers guard Josh Primo, who allegedly exposed himself to a female employee while a member, <coughs> while he was a member <coughs> of the San Antonio Spurs. Primo was suspended for whatever he did. He never exactly admitted to what exactly happens when he gets tinglies in his dingly, but whatever he did, Rest assured, he says it was unintentional. Unintentional. Whoa, hey, looky here. How did my penis get out of my pants? Isn't that a fine how do you do? How does that happen in Texas? I don't know, but everything's bigger in Texas, am I right? You know how exciting the river walk is? Josh Primo, hey man, at least he avoids jail, right? We've all done things where you sit there, you look back and you go, damn, I should have been thrown in jail for that. Happens to all of us. So anytime you can avoid jail is a good day. I'll give him that. But I'm not going to give him my sister's number. Um... Wide receiver Brendan Rice says he is going to leave USC and enter the NFL draft. He had a year left of eligibility. The dude scored 12 touchdowns in the nation. Very productive for the Trojans. That was seventh overall in terms of touchdowns in the nation for wide receivers. Also, obviously, the son of a receiver that you've heard of. So there's that. Rice is, oddly enough, this is a quirk, the second son of an NFL Hall of Fame receiver who's entering the NFL draft. The other would be Marvin Harrison Jr. of Ohio State. Also with USC, something that broke this morning, Dylan Gabriel was considered a possibility at quarterback via the transfer portal because he played at Oklahoma. You're assuming there's a connection with Lincoln Riley, some sort of relationship. Not happening. Dylan has decided to go to Oregon, and that is a big piece of the transfer portal puzzle. Gonzo. Meanwhile, I get that it's becoming super easy to pile on Chip Kelly. Everybody wants to pile on Chip Kelly right now. But I got to be honest with you, there is a reason. The UCLA recruiting class for next year is a legit concern. 
The Bruins have just 11 high schoolers committed for next year's class. 11! It's the 60th ranked class in the country. It's the 15th ranked class of an 18-team Big Ten. The only teams that are beneath UCLA, they all changed their coaches in the offseason, which means the incoming guy was already behind schedule in terms of recruiting. And oh, by the way, the only four-star recruit UCLA had rescinded his commitment. Now, the editor for 24-7 Sports, and we rely a lot on 24-7 for recruiting news, told The Athletic that Kelly's heavy emphasis on the transfer portal carries significant risk. Quote, for every Zach Charbonnet or Leatu Leitu that you get in the portal, you're going to get a Jake Wiley, who never played. You bring them in, don't develop your youngsters, and your offensive line chases off a of Dante Moore. Unquote. Very succinct. It's a bullseye. That's exactly what I think, unfortunately, about UCLA football right now. CBSSports.com went through every NFL team and asked what is going to be their biggest need for next year. It's never too early to ask, I guess, is it? They acknowledge the Chargers have real problems with offensive skill, particularly wide receiver. The Chargers are second in drops in the NFL this year. But to them, the real issue is defensive tackle. Now, I don't know for sure if it's the biggest need, but there is an argument that you can make. Absolutely. Consider this as the possible reason that Brandon Staley has not been able to replicate the defense that he had with the Rams over with the Bolts. Aaron Donald at defensive tackle. I get it. Now, Aaron Donald is a unicorn. Aaron Donald is one of one. But you could ask yourself about the problems in the run defense. You could say if there was at least competence at defensive tackle for the Chargers, that that would even, say, pull one more person away from the edge, which would open up things more for Khalil Mack, for Joey Bosa, etc. Is it possible that the reason Brandon Staley's defense is not functioning is because of defensive tackle? Who plays defensive tackle? You never really know with the Chargers. Kellen Moore had to do a little cleanup on aisle five because some of the scribes took Staley's comments about Austin Eckler possibly losing carries and they took it to the wrong conclusion that Eckler was losing his starting gig. Moore was like, wait a, guy, wait a minute, guys. That's not necessarily true. Quote, we still feel great about Austin. I don't think we're going to see this drastic change here, unquote. I like reading The Athletic. I also like Khalil Mack a lot. But people are making a huge deal over Mack telling The Athletic that he considered retiring after the Bolts were eliminated in Jacksonville last year. Why is it not a huge deal? because he didn't retire, right? Meanwhile, when CBSSports.com asked itself the same question about the biggest need of the Rams, they were like, uh, offensive line? Thanks for the clarity, fellas. But consider how decisive Matthew Stafford has to be behind that offensive line. The Rams line allows their quarterback, whoever's back there, to get pressured in 2.43 seconds. That is definitely among the lowest in the league. 2.43 seconds. Try going back in that. No wonder everything's in the shotgun. You, gotta, you can't go retreat from a center snap like that. You're like, 1-1,000, 1, 2-1,000, 1, oh, crap! So, okay. I wish they were more precise than the offensive line, but so be it. Tyler Higby is also doubtful for Sunday's game. He jacked up his neck last weekend. But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. Tell me who you're going to take in MLS Cup today, LAFC or Columbus. Talk to me if you think yesterday's report actually means that Otani is going to sign with the Dodgers. And if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Porta El Queso production. Take care.